الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى من تبع هداهم إلى يوم الدين <coughs> Indeed, all praises due to Allah and my peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم We are in the second part of our Ahkam al-Jana'iz which means the rulings of or the rules of funerals and we are going through the book of Sheikh al-Albani Muhammad Nasir bin al-Albani rahimahullah now we don't have a full translation of the Sheikh's book we do have something which is equivalent and similar to it and that is the book of the funerals of Sheikh Muhammad al-Jabali hafizahullah so uh, if you have an Arabic book you could follow us inshallah I will add as well and elaborate of some of the points if you haven't you just listen to the lecture inshallah and it will be beneficial we talked about before the person's preparation when he's ill and what he's supposed to do now we're going to go to the person when he's about to die what is we supposed to say so first of all talqeen talqeen prompting the person who's about to die the shahada when a person comes to so a person who's about to die as a person who's knowledgeable you need to prompt him to say the shahada so that if the Prophet ﷺ, he said, he who departs with the shahada on his lips to be the last words, then he will enter paradise. He will enter paradise. Somehow he will enter paradise. Now, whether his sins will be all forgiven straight away and enter paradise, or he's going to be uh, punished and then enter paradise, but he will enter paradise. And the Prophet said, وَإِنْ أَصَابَهُ قَبْلَ ذَلِكَ مَا أَصَابَهُ Even if you were to be doing whatever you've been doing before. As long as you said that, La ilaha illallah, to be the last words in your lips. So when the person sees this person dying, you say to him, <clears throat> say La ilaha illallah. So he said, La ilaha illallah. Now you just stop. You don't say it to him again, unless that person is about to die, said something else. Like for example, he had talked to somebody or he had called for something, then you say to him, say La ilaha illallah. Because the, the la ilaha illallah is to be akhira kalami, the last words coming out of his mouth. Okay? And maybe the person is unable to say it uh, loudly. You can just say it with his lips because he's dying. Okay? So if he said it with his lips, then alhamdulillah, it's good enough. We don't need to basically to make it say it loud and audible. As soon as I see my lips is, is moving, that's inshallah enough for us. And the Prophet ﷺ also he said, "Man mata la yushriku billahi shay'a dakhal al jannah." He who dies associating nothing in the worship of Allah, they will enter paradise. Now that tells us the la ilaha illallah is to be not just a word, something that is a belief. But if a kafir man at the end of his life and he was all the time his kafir and he said it just like this, okay, that is if he, if he was able or was an unable by the Almighty to make this same la ilaha illallah then it will not help him. But normally it is the case. When Allah Azza wa Jal, He says to us, Ya ayyuhal ladhina aman, ittaqu allaha haqqa tuqat, wa la tamutunna illa wa antum musimun. O you who believe, fear Allah as you should be feared. They not accept in a state of Islam with complete submission to Allah. Now, Ibn Kathir, the Mufassir, from the exegetes, the people who are interpreters. In his tafsir, he said that Allah Azza to this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us, die as, as Muslims. How can we die as a Muslim? How can we guarantee? He said that Allah made a universal law. That a person lives upon something, he will die upon it. And if he dies upon something, he will resurrect upon it. Okay? Man mata ala shay, man asha ala shay in mata ali, man mata ala shay in bu'itha ali. So this is a universal law. So if your life all the time was <clears throat> singing, when it comes to the last moment of your life, even if somebody said to you, say, La ilaha illallah, you'll start singing. This was going to come to your mind. We call it, this is the uncontrolled mind, the autopilot, I should say, the autopilot. And I'll give you an example so you understand what I'm saying. If this person, for example, had been living in a certain place for 20 years and suddenly he changes place and he lived somewhere else 
<clears throat> believe me, in the first two weeks happened to me, or even more, his car or his legs will take him to his old address without him realizing. He will end up in the, the place that he's lived there for 20 years, and what am I doing here? And he would realize that what had kicked in is autopilot. This is a blessing from Allah Azza wa because if we have to use the mind all the time in order to do our normal daily life, we're going to get a headache. That's the headache comes in because of, you know, you think too much. But because there's an autopilot, Allah made it that you relax. Your body had got used to, to go to this place. Your body had got used to eat this particular food. Your body got used to, so that will take over. You don't have to think because it will come in by itself. Same thing here when you're about to die. What you have been using, used to do all the time, it will come in. Subhanallah. And this is as well, I watched it on um, a, a documentary called Touching the Void. Two British people went to a certain place in the south of the hemisphere where next to Chile and all of these areas, and they wanted to climb a mountain. And that is mountain at the top, there will be the ice and the snow and the glacier and all of that. And this is a documentary I would urge you to go and look at it. It's about, it's just, it's the two people trying to see what happened to them. And they, they put actors to, to do exactly what happened to them. Now, one of them had fell in a carcass or car caracas, which is something, what do you call it, in the ditch in the, in the snow. And somehow, because he brought his leg, he was almost about to die. <coughs> he managed to pull out himself from that death. When he was in that moment about to die, he started to swear. The swearing came to him because he's been swearing during his life. And then when he tried to, came, to come out and then he was so happy and then for days trying to catch up with the other people whom they thought that he's dead. And if they left the area, he's dead. But the last moment he's about to die, he let go of himself. He said, kicked into my mind. Now the song of Boney M. I don't know what's the song of Boney M, but they put that music of it on that documentary. Because he'd been listening to it, it kicked in. SubhanAllah. So they remember, SubhanAllah. So even you're going to say to him, La ilaha illallah, he's going to say, Boney M, huh? the music of that. So when you come to a dying person, remember, you could say to him, La ilaha illallah, and he will not say it. And if one of the listeners here now, Sheikh Abdul Latif, Hafizahullah, He's at the moment in Syria. Maybe he's listening from there at the moment. He had witnessed something which is like this. There's a person, his name is Ayman Akshar, who was a Muslim. Not a Muslim, but even he was a khatib. Not only a khatib, he used to as well, if somebody phones him, he will tell you hadith sahih, not hadith sahih. Is it correct, not incorrect? And this person, subhanAllah, he came to this country, he was from... Syria, came to this country, and somehow he was as well advising, even Sheikh Abdul Latif used to refer to him to ask him for some of the hadiths, but the fitna, true. he left Islam. He married to somebody, and it's a long story. If you want to have the whole story, it is actually recorded on uh, YouTube uh, in one of my classes in uh, Luton. Anyway, it's a long story, fascinating story. He married to somebody who's Christian, and then he became not just a Christian, he was the head of a cult, the head of a cult of Christianity. SubhanAllah, it's like a, a big priest. Now, since that time, I mean, Abdul Latif couldn't really believe it. So he tried to make connection with him and contact with him until he had been hit with cancer. So he went to the hospital to see him there. SubhanAllah. Fascinating. And Every time his wife leaves him because she, she knows Abdul Latif, she leaves him, he's with him, he's trying to tell him what happened to you. Okay, what's, and because as well, his, his brother disowned him and all of that, his mother doesn't know that he's a head of a culture still in Syria and all of this. Before he died, he was there in that moment of death, Abdul Latif. He said to him, say, La ilaha illallah. You know what he did? He did, boom, 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 boom. he couldn't say it because he was not saying it when he was alive. Allah blocked him from that word of saying la ilaha illallah. So that's a fascinating 
reminder for us. So it is not just simply that to do all naughty things and then come to the moment of death and then somebody then say to me, la ilaha illallah, it would be easy for me to say la ilaha illallah. And I have a number of stories about this. One of the sheikh told us about somebody had a black crash in one of the Muslim countries and the music was on. And he's about to die. So one of the sheikh was passing by in his car and he stopped. And he said to him, say the kalima, la ilaha illallah. And he started singing. Say la ilaha illallah. And he started singing. Allahumma Now, that's the talqeen. And by the way, the talqeen is to say to him, say la ilaha illallah. It is not to mention next to him, you know, uh, it is good to say la ilaha illallah. And you say to talk to somebody else. No, you prompt him. Because people think, some people think that you just, you know, mention the word and he has to take it. No, no, you mention it to him. For verily the Prophet وسلم, he paid a visit to one of the Ansar and he said to him, Khal, that is a maternal uncle, Khal, Qul la ilaha illallah. He said, Am I an uncle from the mother's side or the father's side? But he was not, it's just it's a word. He says, like a sense of humor. He said to him, No, no, you are a, an uncle from the mother's side. So he said to him, Okay, well, it's better for me to say la ilaha illallah. So the Prophet said, Yes. They said, La ilaha illallah. As for recitation of Surah Yasin, as people they think, Surah Yasin, Ya Ikhwani, you need to know that Surah Yasin, there is no virtues, especially to it, except being part of the Quran. So Yasin, Qalbul Quran, the heart of the Quran is fabricated hadith. To recite Surah Yasin in the cemetery is a bidah. To recite Surah Yasin when the person is dying is a bidah. For the person who is dying to recite Surah Yasin is a bidah, innovation. Even when you're about to, to sleep, to say, recite Surah Yasin, all of that, there is not a single hadith would specify Yasin with something like the other surahs of, for example, Al Baqarah or Al Imran or the end of the Baqarah or Al Imran or Surah Tabarak or Surah Al Kafirun or Surah, 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 Surah There's no specific hadith. It doesn't mean it is nothing, but I'm just saying to use that surah when you're about to die, whether the people are reciting it for you or you reciting it while you're about to die, that's not correct. Busy yourself with La ilaha illallah. And also, to make a person who's about to die facing the Qibla. That's another bid'ah. For verily, the person is to be put towards the Qibla. Let's say the Qibla direction is towards the camera here. So he will be put onto the right side like this with his face. That is, if he is dead and he's been placed in the grave. But to put him like this facing the Qibla on his right, that is, before he dies, let's say he's just about to die. He fell unconscious. He's in a coma. That's incorrect. Or even some of the brothers, maybe this is the first time you've heard this. When they put the corpse, the dead body, and they want to pray on him the salah, they also do the same thing like he's in the grave. So they put him, that is, they make, uh, they, they make the head on the right of the imam. Ya ikhwani, whether the head is on the right of the imam, or the head is on the left of the imam, it doesn't matter. It's where the imam stands, as we're going to talk about it when it comes to the prayer, inshallah, that is not today. So, we've learned now, so Yasin is not from the sunnah, nor as well to face him to the pillar while he is dying. It's only when we put him in the grave. Sa'id ibn Musayyib, he said, why do you, do you have to because of the qibla? He's already a Muslim. So when he got to him to death and he's about to die, he was in a the stupor, the, 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 the um, what do you call that? The pa death pangs, the death pangs. So he's unconscious, conscious, unconscious. One of those uh, followers is called Abu Salam ibn Abdul Rahman. He came to him. So when he went in his pangs and he fell unconscious, this Salam Abu Salam Abdul Rahman, he had made him to, with a, he had just pushed the bed so that his face will be for, facing towards the Kaaba. And he woke up after that. And then he saw that he's been, you know, Move. So he said, How well to feel, Rashi? Did you move your bed? Did you turn it the other way around? They said, Yes. And then he looked at Abu Salama, huh? Ibn Abdul Rahman. He said, I believe it was you who had done this. You told him to do so. He said, Yes, I had told him to do so. So Said, he said, Turn me back as I was. It's incorrect. It is incorrect to think that I need to be towards the Qibla when I'm about to die. Otherwise, in the hospitals where people are dying, we're going to make all these beds. Huh? Imagine. Facing towards the Qibla. It's going to be subhanAllah. Everybody wants to be on the Sunnah. Akhi. So the hospital will not be managing to put their beds because all of them have to be like one after the other. But Alhamdulillah, Allah made it special. There's no such thing 
that the sunnah that the person that is about to die to be facing the Qibla. Otherwise, as I said, you're going to have trouble in the hospital beds. Right. Now, is it permissible for me to go and pay a visit to somebody who is not Muslim and is about to die? Yes. For Verily, as long as you are hoping for that person to become a Muslim. Like our brother Abdul Latif, when he paid a visit to this person called Ayman Aksha. By the way, we could put Ayman. A-Y-M-A-N and then space Akshar, A-K-S-H-A-R. For Ayman Akshar, and you will see his, uh, subhanAllah, at how he died as a Christian, and he was buried in a Christian graveyard, but you will not know the story of our Abdul Latif, if he was his friend. This person, Ayman Akshar, he was the head of a cult. Okay? So, the Latif, he paid him a visit, hoping that he will embrace Islam, he will come out of the kufr. Because when he was talking to him about Islam, he was holding the hand of Abdul Latif, holding it, but can't say the kalima. He cannot say that the word La ilaha illallah, his mouth is blocked. From any saying, he could say anything, but not La ilaha illallah. When the Prophet ﷺ paid a visit to a Jewish boy, he used to serve the Prophet, he used to work as a servant for the Prophet. So he's about to die. So he sat down next to his head. So he said to him, embrace Islam. Look at that. Prophet came not to waste time here, to save him from the fire. Embrace Islam. So this boy had reached the puberty, and he now at the moment is going to be questioned by Allah, still a Jewish, embrace Islam. So this boy, he looked at his father, and he was next to him. So his father said to him, Obey Abu al-Qasim. Obey Abu al-Qasim. Abu al-Qasim is the kunya of the Prophet. He said, Obey Abu al-Qasim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu al-Qasim is the kunya whom the Jews used to give it to the Prophet when they, you know, when they respect him. If they don't really respect it, it's Ibn Abi Kapsha or Muhammad. But when they say Abu al-Qasim, that's a respect. He said to his son, and he's Jewish, after Abu al-Qasim, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he said, Ashhadu la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad. So the Prophet left and he said, Alhamdulillah, please be to Allah, alladhi anqadahu min al-nar, but Allah saved him from the fire. And when he died, he said, Sallu ala sahibu, pray on your brother. That means he became a Muslim, even though he said the word at the last moment before he died. But here you could just see, look at it. his father, he knows the haqq. His pride, and you could say his arrogance, prevented him from saving himself and saying the word. But because he knows that the haqq is there, he didn't want his son to end up like him. He wanted his son to be in Jannah. That is why he said to him, follow, obey Abu al-Qasim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Amazing is that. SubhanAllah. But this father, even though that he's wrong, and he knows he's wrong, he's upon kufr and shirk, but he didn't want his son to end up like him. He couldn't break his pride. Just like Abu Talib, when we talk about his death, when it comes to his death, the same thing, the pride, the arrogance. He said to his nephew, the Prophet Muhammad he said, had it been the people of Quraysh would say that I'm scared. When I said the word, I would have you know, delighted you with it. I would have said it. Look at the pride. It lingers to the person until his death, prevented him from saying the kalim. Now, what's supposed to be done upon, for those people who are around? Uh, after his death, if he dies, and he had, you know, the soul came out, so they have to do the following. Number one, close his eyes. So his eyes are open, close it. Or verily, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu he said that uh, uh, when the soul is being taken, then the eyesight will as well. So you, as soon as you see the person dying, and I'm sure that there is a video clips of lots of people dying now because of the lots of cameras captured in person as he was talking to them dying, his eyes goes back straight away eyes go back so it will go back and you must stay open eye so he close his eyes be dead and make a supplication Salam, as she said the prophet Salam, entered upon abu Salam, her husband and he started to stare out of death so he closed his eyes and then he said verily the soul when it has been taken the eyesight will follow so some of the people of his family they started, you know, making a clamor, a noise of what's happening. So the Prophet said, hold on, do not 
call upon yourself except for good. For very the angels are around and they will say Ameen to whatever you say. So make sure that you say something good. And then he said, and he raised up, he said, Allahumma ghfir li Abi Salama, O oh Lord, forgive to Abu Salama, warfa' darajatahu fil mahdiyin, and elevate his rank amongst the righteous, wa khluffu fi aqibihi fil ghabirin, and also leave him good people to substitute and to, and to look after those people who are he left behind. وَاغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلَهُ يَا رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ And forgive for us and for him, O Lord, of everything that exists. وَفْسَحْ لَهُ فِي قَبْرِهِ وَنَوِّرْ لَهُ فِيهِ And also uh, expand his grave and basically enlighten, put light into it. Also, what is supposed to be done by the people who are around when the person dies is to cover him all his body, including his head. So when the Prophet Sallallahu he died, he was with a cloak, with a cloak, he was covered all of him, and with his head as well. Okay, right. And also, that there is an exception here. And that is when the person dies in a state of ihram. If the person dies in a state of ihram, then we're not allowed to cover his head and not allowed to cover his face. Why? For the following reason. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, but what a man, okay, a man, he was on top of his camel while he was in Arafah. Uh, he fell and the camel stepped onto him. So he died. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, wash him with water and lot. Lot is like the soap, which is the leaves of the lot, lot tree. And shroud him in his two thobe, that means you know, the, the garment that he puts the man for the ihram, which is the two pieces. In these two pieces, okay, uh, in these two pieces, then shroud him with it. So in the two pieces become a shroud for him. And do not perfume him. Do not put the perfume. Because we, we normally when we wash the person, we put some camphor or some perfume in the last wash. Don't put perfume. And do not cover his face or his head. Or verily. He will be sent on the day of resurrection with talbiyah on his lips. Remember what we said? That Allah's universal law, if you die upon something, you'll be, if you live upon something, you'll die upon it. And if you die upon it, you'll be resurrected upon it. So this person, can I come from the grave? Labbaik Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika laka labbaik. He's in talbiyah, he's in ihram. People are worried and he's not worried. He's just coming out with Talbiyah. What a way to die. This person is coming out of his grave with Talbiyah on his lips. So do not perfume him. Just like a Shaheed. You know what the Shaheed? Everybody will be scared except for the Shaheed. This person has one died of a set of Haram. Talbiyah on his lips and he's dressed up with the clothes of the Haram of his. And also from the thing that is incumbent upon the people around him when he dies is to make sure that they will speed up the process of, uh, you know, making the funeral procession, meaning, you know, speed up the process of the wash and also the uh, shroud and also the prayer and also the burial, and also paying the, making sure that the debt is going to be as well settled, okay? Asriya'u bil janaza. Hasten the process of the funeral. Make sure that you, and also from that as well, to be buried in the place where he died. It's not correct that if somebody died and he is, for example, originally from uh, X, Z, Y country, to go be shipped to that country. Because we have Muslim cemeteries here. We don't have a Muslim cemetery, then we go to the nearest place in this country where there's a Muslim cemetery. But we cannot ship him to, for example, Jordan or Pakistan or India. It's not correct. Okay? Because uh, it will. Uh, oppose the Prophet's command, which is to hasten the process. And when you're going to ship him somewhere else, you know what they do to him? They will embarb him. Embarbing the person, it involves, undertakers will take him and then will remove his intestines and will fill him with alcohol. Why? In order for him to be preserved and not to rot. SubhanAllah. Look what's going to happen. So 
lots of things. His intestines will be taken out. It's going to be filled up with alcohol inside. I have seen it. I've seen this because we had to bury somebody. It's a woman. She was about a relative of She was shipped from a different country to be buried in our country. And we said, why? And he was shipped from Saudi Arabia to be buried in Jordan. I said, he should have been buried there. She had an accident. He should have been buried there. So when they brought her to us in Jordan, and I was the person who is a supervisor there for them, the brothers of hers, who were really so proud, because he was young, he was only about uh, 22, 23 years old, they wanted to bury her in the grave. I said, nobody goes inside except for her mahram. Okay, so they want the maharim, which is their brothers, to go inside. So they had to take the now the shroud, which has been done for Saudi Arabia. And they had to open a bit. And when they, when they opened the plastic, which rounds it, and I, we're putting a blanket on top of it so nobody can see, they were suffocating. They came out because the alcohol smell came out. Allah. Why should we do that? What also shocked me is that a woman, her husband died in Pakistan. Okay? And then, because she lives in this country, and he was on a visit to the country in Pakistan, his own country, she commanded for him to be shipped back to the UK. That was amazing. That was a shock for me. Allahu al-musta'ad. So we understand now that we have to bury him where he is. As for the people who are shuhada, they have to be buried in the place where they've been killed. Like the shuhada of Uhud, the martyrs of Uhud, they were buried in the place, in the area where they died. That's why we have near the mountain of Uhud, those 70 martyrs of the companions. Right. So that is how we will uh, bury the people. Aisha radiallahu anha, when one of her brothers had died, and it was in a valley in Al-Habash, Abyssinia, so he was, he was taken from his place. Uh, she said, Aisha, I mean, and that grieves me as well here, that it makes me sad. But I would have loved for him to be buried where he died. Why should he be carried from all the way from there? Because there's a Muslim cemetery. Also, it's incumbent upon the people uh, that is to settle his debt. Whether his debt has been settled by his own money that he left, or the money of the relatives, or any person. Any person, he could pay the debt on behalf of the person who had died. For verily, the Prophet wasallam, he had said, everything will be forgiven except for the loan. Even the shaheed. Everything will be forgiven for him except for the loan. So make sure that the loan is settled. Here we have a hadith, a number of hadith. We will just choose one of them. And that is that the Prophet wasallam, at the beginning, he did not even offer that prayer himself. He made the prayer for the people to pray on him. On those people who are uh, died and had the debt, and the debt hasn't been settled. He would not pray upon them until later on, after they had, you know, the, the, the treasury, the house of treasury was filled with money because of the war booties and all of that. He started, any person, he said, any person who dies, he left alone and it's not being settled because he was keen to settle it. But he died without settling, we will settle on his behalf. But at the beginning, Prophet Allah would not even pray on him. So let's just see one of the ahadith here. Jabir ibn Abdullah, he said, a man, we died and we have washed him, shrouded him, and then we took him to the Prophet وسلم, to the place where the Janazah is, which is next to the graveyard, there's a place for praying the Janazah. And uh, Prophet وسلم, is about to pray on him. So he said, and he said to us, maybe he's in debt. They said, yes, Messenger of Allah, two dinars. Each dinar is a gold, gold in dinar, which is 4.25 on the 24 carats of gold. So let's say he's about, about yeah, maybe less than 300 pounds. Okay, it's about eight grams, nine grams of gold, eight and a half grams altogether. Okay, if each gram at the moment is 45 or 50, it's about 300 pounds anyway. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he just said, okay, go and offer the prayer. I'm not going to pray. So man, he said, which is his name, Abu Qatada, Messenger of Allah, I'll pay on his behalf. So the Prophet said, he said, okay, they are upon you and they're going to be settled from your own money. And the deceased is free from that. He said, yes, Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet of Allah led the prayer. Then he met Abu Qatada later on, which is the following day, just the following day. He said, what did you do with the two dinars? Did you settle them? He said, Messenger of Allah, he only died yesterday. 
and the Prophet he didn't like what he said. Then he met him on the following day, two days after. What did you do with the two dinars? Did you pay them? He said, yes, Messenger of Allah, I paid them. He said, now you have cooled the flesh of your brother. It's like the, his brother, that means the brother in Islam. The one who died, who had the debt, his, his flesh is hot. He's under the fire. Now you cool him down once you have paid the debt, subhanAllah. So treat debts to be serious. So in this ahadith, we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that the person will benefit from another person if he pays his debt, regardless if he's a son or a relative or even a stranger. So if you pay the debt on behalf of somebody, I would be okay, inshallah. But he will not be benefited from him if he, for example, he just made charity on his behalf. No. It has to be from a son of his, or from a daughter of his, or the son of hers, or the son of daughter of hers. But not, a, not a, but the debt, yes, it is allowed. Also, we're going to talk about the siyam, another, that is the vow. Somebody has vowed to fast a day or two days. Okay? When he vows, so if he dies, the person who is closest from his relatives, he could fulfill that fast and fast on his behalf. Fine. Alhamdulillah, that we have now come to uh, what we have decided to say. And we will, yes, what is permissible to be done now? What is permissible to be done to the people? Uh, which around the person who is about to die. What is permissible for them to do? Number one, it's permissible for them to uh, uncover his face, okay, and kiss him, and also uh, basically uh, cry for him upon him for three days. And you have a number of hadith regarding this issue. Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, when my father was killed, he was martyred in the Battle of Uhud. I started lifting up the, you know, the, 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 the thing that is a cover on his face and crying. And they told me off, my aunties. The Prophet he does not tell me off. Then the Prophet وسلم, he commanded, commanded for him to be taken. And he said, now we're going to be buried. So uh, Fatima, my auntie, she started crying. The Prophet وسلم, he said to her, cry, you don't cry. Oh, really. The angels, they were shading him with their wings until you lifted him up. So don't worry about him. Also, we have Aisha, عنها, she said that Abu Bakr, عنها, he came from his place where it is in a Samih. And he's, he came and he entered the masjid. And when the Prophet, وسلم, he died, um, so Umar, he was telling the people, if anybody says Muhammad وسلم, had died, I will kill him. I will hit him. Um, he, the Prophet of Allah, he went to his Lord just like Musa السلام, went to speak to his Lord. So he did not speak to him, nor he spoke to the people until he entered upon Aisha, the where the Prophet of Allah died. And he went to the Prophet وسلم, and he was covered. Then he uncovered his face and he started to kiss him between his eyes. Between his eyes. And then he started crying. And he said, I sacrificed my father and my mother for you, Messenger of Allah. For verily, Allah Azza wa Jal will not make you to taste the two death. As for the death that you have supposed to do it, then you have died it. You have done it. So this is the death that there will be no death after it. So it's, a, it's, it's permissible uh, uh, after or before the person has been washed, the, the, the deceased, to take him to his family in order for them to have a last look on him and to kiss him in his eyes. But all of that depends upon that these people will respect the inviolables in, uh, of Islam, maharim in Islam. So if it's going to cause for them to go and start wailing or breaking their clothes and pulling their hairs and do things which is haram, it's not allowed. We will not send them to the house. We'll take the deceased straight away to the masjid to offer the prayer. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that the Prophet وسلم, he entered upon Uthman ibn Mazarun and he was dead. So he uncovered his face and he started kissing him 
between his eyes and he started crying. Um, Aisha, she said, I have seen even the tears going onto his cheeks. Uh, also, Anas radiallahu anh, he said, we entered with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and there was a, uh, a child for, uh, there was the child of the Prophet of Allah, Ibrahim alayhi salam, that is the, the, the Prophet sallallahu son, and the Prophet of Allah, he took him, he held him, and he started kissing him, and smelling him, um, and Ibrahim was just about to die, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi crying, so Abdul Rahman al said, Messenger of Allah, you do that and you are the Prophet? He said, oh Ibn Awf, this is a mercy. So he, 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 he followed with another fear. Okay, and then he said, verily, the eye is shedding tears, the heart is in sadness, in grief and sorrow, and we do not say except what pleases Allah, our Lord. And verily, we are so saddened with your departure, O Ibrahim. That's the son of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Uh, also from Abdullah ibn Ja'far radiallahu an, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when Ja'far ibn Talib, he died, which is his cousin, he said, the Prophet of Allah, uh, give the family of Al-Ja'far three days to wait, patience. And then he came to them after three days, he said, do not cry upon him after today. So this is the three days that we have mentioned. What the relatives are supposed to do, they must do the following, that is, uh, 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 be patient. And not to act in a way which will displease Allah Azza wa Jal. So Anas radiallahu anhu said, the Prophet he passed by a woman whom she was crying next to a grave. So he said to her, fear Allah and be patient. So she said, go away. You haven't got the same uh, uh, crisis that I've got. You haven't got the same, you know, you were not struck with the same thing. It was said to her, by the way, what you have just said, what you have said is the Prophet of Allah. Death just like came to her. She didn't know he was a Prophet of Allah. But she straight away followed the Prophet. And she entered on his house. He did not find gate, uh, uh, which we call him dark gate, uh, guards, gate guards. Because he's a Prophet of Allah, he doesn't got guards. Nobody's to, there's no secretaries, there's nothing. He's the head of the state, yet he's got no guards. So she came on to him, she said, Messenger of Allah, I didn't know it was you. He said, well, the patience is the first strike. That means to, to gain the biggest reward is to be having the patience at the first strike. Not now, too late, you lost it. Okay, so the patience is that at the first strike. Right. Also, uh, we have, From that, that we should be as well. Uh, from uh, that is, if the woman, her husband, uh, who died, then she is to be in her idda for four months and ten days. And we say here as well, from the thing that is supposed to be as well done by the people who are around him, from the relatives, is to say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. So the second thing is to say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. To Allah we belong, and to him we shall return. Allahumma ajurni fi musibati wa akhli fi khayr. O Lord, reward me my calamity and bestow me something better. You say that. For verily, Allah Azza wa Jal will uh, comfort you in your crisis, in your calamity. For verily, Um Salim radiallahu anha, when my husband Abu Salama died, we spoke about, Okay, so soon as he died, she said, who's going to be better than Abu Salam? First person who migrated to, uh, to Abyssinia, the first person who migrated in the sake of Allah. Nobody's going to be better. And she said, I remember the words that the Prophet of Allah, he said, if you stuck with the calamity, say the words. He said, he said, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Allahumma jurni fi musibati wa akhli fi khayr. Oh Lord, reward me my calamity and bestow me something better in exchange. What happened? She got the Prophet of Allah to be her husband. She said, who's going to be, who's going to be better than Abu Salama? Prophet of Allah married her. And he's better than Abu Salama. He's better than a hundred of them. A hundred of Abu Salama. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the person does not, does not forget these words. Whenever you find somebody's death, a relative of yours, son, mother, father, remember the calamity of the death of the Prophet Muhammad. This is the biggest of all calamities. 
And remember to say the words, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji. Allahumma jarni fi musibati. And also we find here as well that if the woman uh, whom she's married and other than her husband had died, then it's better for her just to give the comfort to her husband rather than to be uh, in mourning for three days and so her husband will not be able to make what he makes to his wife. Okay? In which we're going to be talking about the story of Um Sulaim radiallahu anha. But if those women, instead of you know moaning upon her relatives, whether it's her father or her son, okay, for three days, okay, it's not her husband, it would be better for her just to beautify herself for her husband rather than to uh, leave that, which is the call we call it al hidad, moaning on the person. Here <clears throat> we find Um Sulaim, of course, if it is to do with a husband, it has to be four months and ten days, as we said. Four months and ten days. As for other than the husband, three days she moans. And by the way, uh, when the woman, her husband dies, she must put black dress for three days. So put the black dress for three days. Maybe some people, they don't know that. Coming back. Um uh, Sulaim, radiallahu anha, what happens? That when her husband, Malik, he left her and he was a kafir. Okay, he's the father of Anas. He's the mother of Anas. Uh, somebody else wanted to get married to her. And that person is Abu Talha. Al Ansari radiallahu anha. Abu Talha, he came to her and he asked for her hand. So she said to him, Ya Abu Talha, you Abu Talha. I mean, nobody can refuse you. But you are a kafir. Disbeliever, I am a Muslim. It's not going to be allowed for me to marry you. So he said, Oh, I don't think this is your dowry. So she said, Well, what's my dowry then? He said, Oh, the white and the gold. That means the gold and the silver. The gold and the silver. She said, I don't want any gold or any silver. I just want Islam as my dowry. For very, if you embrace Islam, I will not ask you for anything else. He said, Okay. Who should I do that? What, what can I say that? Where can I become Muslim? She said, go to the Prophet. So Abu Taha went to the Prophet. And he was sitting amongst his companions. So when he said to him, when Prophet of Allah, he saw him, he said, well, Abu Talha coming to you and it looks like Islam is on his face. SubhanAllah. You know, the person when he want to base Islam, there's a, something going to change in his face. I could see Islam between his eyes. So he told the Prophet of Allah what Um Sulaim she had said. So straight away, he embraces Islam and he married to her. Now, the story goes on. That Anas radiallahu anhu said, we've never heard of any dowry which is more greater than the dowry of Um Sulaim, his mother, whom she had accepted Islam as to be her dowry. So Abu Talha, when he married to her, he got a child from her. And that child is the brother of Anas, of course, from the mother's side. And he used to love him so much, Abu Talha, his father. The boy got ill. And this boy, by the way, he is the same boy whom Prophet Allah came to visit a number of times. His name is Abu Umair. He was having a bird called This is the boy. He got ill so much. And Abu Talha, he was himself feeling that he's ill because of his son's ill. He's feeling he's very weak, can't do anything about it. So every time he comes from the Prophet ﷺ to his wife, he would ask, what happens to my son? Is he okay? Then he go back to the Prophet of Allah to learn more about the deen. One day, the child had died. So Um Sulaim, she said, no one to tell the news of the death of my son to my husband except for me. So she prepared the boy. She had covered him. And she would put him next to the you know, next to the house, and it was in a corner of the house. And Abu Talha came from the Prophet. So he asked her, the first thing he would ask her away, how is my child? He says, Oh Abu Talha, since he was complaining, he never been quieter than today. SubhanAllah, that's true. She's not lying. Because he's dead. He doesn't say anything, he does not complain. Since he was complaining. He's not quiet and not more relaxed than today. 
So she brought him his dinner to eat and he went to the bed to have a sleep. What she did, she put some perfume on herself. Look at that, that's the mother. You know, her child is in her heart and no one would grief and have sorrow on her child, on the child more than the mother. More than, no way. But she stepped over her feeling to satisfy her husband. SubhanAllah. Allahu Akbar. So she beautified herself and she went into the bed with Abu Bakr. Utal Hassan as he saw her, you know, in this way, it just triggered him and triggered his lust straight away. He makes the intercourse with him. Then after he had finished, and it was the end of the night, before Fajr, she said, oh Abu Talha, verily, if someone had given you something to borrow, if some people given other people something to borrow, and then those people are asked for that borrow to be brought back to them. No, what about they borrowed, they should send it back. She said, well, Allah Azza wa Jal had gave you your child as a borrow, and now he took him, so that means you should not be complained, you should not prevent. So be patient and hope for the word from Allah. He was angry. She said, you made me to do what I made, that means, which is you made me to do what I made, that means the intercourse. And now you're telling me about the death of my son? And he remembered, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajum. Allahumma adumihi musibati wa akhlifi khayramin. He praised Allah Azza wa Jal, and he, in the Fajr, he made his ghusl, he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he told him. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Allah put barakah in that night of yours. So that night of the intercourse, Allah put barakah into it. Khalas, there's a child produced. Straight away she was pregnant. Allah. And Umm Sulaim, she used to travel with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was, Prophet Allah was a mahram for her. Prophet Allah was a mahram for her. She was a maternal aunt through fostering. Um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when she had given birth to uh, Umm Sulaim, he asked for the child to be brought. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is the one who had given him the tahniq. It's a long story. We want to finish now. And inshallah, give you the opportunity to ask questions. Zakullah khayran. The question system, please. Uh, please remind us, Ya Ahmed. What is the it's question? Final, Okay, for the benefit of those who didn't join from the start of the lecture, or those that just need a reminder, our co-host Hassan, may Allah reward him, he gave us some advice for the questions and answers session, because we had a lot of people yesterday, and we need to make a change to the way we conduct the Q&A, so that there's no chaos, because we've had three or four people jumping in on the mic at the same time trying to ask the Sheikh. So what we will do is keep everybody muted, and if you wish to ask a question, then you just need to raise your hand, okay? Just raise your hand and we will unmute you. If the sisters wish to ask their questions as well on the microphone, that's fine. Or if they prefer to write it down, that's no problem either. Brothers, you're also allowed to write, to type your question. But if you could use the microphone, this would make it easier upon us. Jazakumullah khairan. I don't know if they know how to, or you know, put their hands up because some people they're not familiar with this technology. Yeah. We've got some raised hands. Yeah, Sheikh. Can I ask uh, uh, the question uh, that I wanted to ask yesterday? It's out of the topic of the talk. <laughs> The first question is supposed to be from the topic, but because you have clicked in always. No, me. okay, I can wait. I can wait, yeah, sure. Okay, it's better to wait, it would be better. Yeah, yallah. Just, because it, today is a funeral. Everybody should be asking about funeral now. No. Barakallahu feek. Fazl? You're unmuted, Fazal Ibrahim. Can you guys hear me? Uh, we can hear you loud and clear. Problem. Sheikh, can I put the video on or is it only audio? It's better to put audio on. The, 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 the weaker internet, that's the problem. Okay, Sheikh, I'll be quick. I'll try to explain then. Assalamu alaikum. Um, the question here 
here in America, and I'm sure also in England and elsewhere, we typically bury in the coffin. And we know the sunnah is to turn the body towards the qibla. But because when we use the coffin, we see the body is placed flat on the back with only the head facing the qibla. Because if we place the body towards the qibla, the body would fall back down. So is this allowed when burying in the coffin, flat on the back with just the head facing the qibla? Barakallahu feek. And the whole box, and the whole box goes down, also facing the qibla. So let's say, for example, the qibla is the direction of the camera. So the box will be, let's just see, that's the box of the person who's dead. So that person is inside, okay? So he's inside this, okay? This is the box, and that's the qibla. So his head will be on the right. So if his head is just only turning, no problem. It doesn't have to be with the body. So his head, the most important is his head. It doesn't have to be the body. Okay? We make it the body because it will be easier with the body. So we put something to, to, to raise him a bit up, just this way, to make his head. But, uh, for example, our Sheikh al-Albani, rahimahullah, when he died, I was there, present. And the person who had buried him, he's dead himself. Rahmatullah. A student, Sheikh Azad Khabar, Abu Abdullah, may Allah have mercy upon all of us. Um, when he put him in his lahd, Sheikh was having lahd, not shak. Uh, we, we could see the, the we, we, but, but we can't see the lahd itself. He's the only one, and other person could see it. But we could see down when, when the sheikh was lowered. When he put him inside, subhanAllah, straight away, his head turned to the sheikh by itself. So the head is the one that's required, it's not the body. Okay? The head is the one that's required, it's not the body. Does that answer the question you are uh, puzzled? Yes, sheikh. Barakallah, Hufiq. Thank you so much. You're welcome, sheikh. Now, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Okay, um, a question for you. Um, is it um, better or is it okay for a close relative of the deceased to lead a janazah prayer, or it's better for the Imam of the community to lead a janazah prayer? The correct opinion is the Imam of the community, and if it was the Imam, which is the Khalifa, even better, or the head of the state. And if the head of the state, he had, is not there, but he had put representatives, which is the, the Imam of the Masjid is a representative of the head of state, the Khalifa. So he will take over. Um, it's not the people whom they think, oh, it's the relative of the deceased, the closest. That's not correct. For well, Valili, at the time of one, uh, one of the uh, uh, people who had died, and Valili, we had... Uh, Al Hassan or Kidi Al Hussein, I can't remember which one of the two brothers, that uh, they were somebody in the Medina who was the lead. So, because he's the Imam, he said to him, Had it been the Sunnah that the Imam leads, I would never let you to make to lead. He was talking in him, he said, I would not let you to lead because he was upset with him and he's not happy with him. Had it been the Sunnah, I would never let you to, to lead. So, he made him to lead because he's the Sunnah. Otherwise, if it was left like this, he would lead. They would not let that guy to lead. No. Fadal Yamah Muhammad, Dawood. Now, Salaam Alaikum, Sheikh. Salaam Alaikum, Sheikh. Salaam Alaikum, Sheikh. Now, uh, my question is, uh, in this country, some people, they take student loan uh, while they're at the university. Now, uh, one of those people dies with the debt. About you know what was uh, what we've been told is uh, the student loan will be written off, so that uh, the family hasn't got to do anything. So, what's the uh, result of this? Stay on 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 just because you, you you do not really make it very understandable. Somebody died and he had a debt for a country for the country itself. So when yeah, he died, student loan, huh? student loan, so, student loan, student loan. I understand. And he died and the student loan was not being given back in this country. Yes, but we are told the loan will be written off because upon the death, yes. the loan has been written off. Alhamdulillah. But first of all, let me address the brothers who are listening. Student loans through the system, which is now, is not allowed, regardless of the fatwa that you have heard from X, Z, and Y. It is not mudaraba. No. It is not called mudaraba. I've read it, I looked at it, it's not mudaraba. 
person yeah. should avoid that uh, loan system. But if the loan is being taken off, alhamdulillah, you know, lots of people as well, they were in debt to a, a government or something, and they liquidate, in the word liquidate themselves, and that's the system of the, the accepted. But you cannot liquidate yourself from human beings, normal ones. Like, for example, if you liquidate, and I, I, I'm a person who is a customer, you can't just you know, take my money. You have to pay it back for me because the government no. compensated me. No. 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 Barakallahu fikum, Sikir. Man, who's next? Abu Muhammad. Hello, Abu Muhammad. This is Abu, Abu Ahmad Sharif. Give me the full. When you, when you unclick that, Ya Habibi, just tell me what's his name on the screen. It's just Abu Muhammad, Sheikh. Abu Muhammad. Yalla, Abu Muhammad. Fadal Abu Muhammad. Abu Muhammad, can you hear us? Okay. Hello? Yes, I could hear you loud and clear. Yeah, Sheikh, um, you mentioned the body shouldn't be transferred. Say if sometimes I've heard some of the scholars of the past were taken to Medina. Is that correct? So you're saying to me that, uh, what's your question is, I don't know why, you, why didn't you, but we kept asking you, Abu Muhammad, you're not really, I don't know, you're not able to listen to us or to hear us, but it doesn't matter. Maybe it's the uh, I was able to, but I had a problem using the system. I, I'm not used to using the mic. Yeah, yeah, no problem. All of us, we are like that. Okay. Uh, so they say that somebody died and he has asked for himself to be taken to Baqi al Gharqat. That's what we say. Baqi al Gharqat is Medina. Well, uh, the, uh, for verily, the Prophet وسلم, he said he was able to die in the Medina, then let him do so. Meaning, it doesn't mean that you go to Medina and you carry a, a gun or a, or a knife and kill yourself there. It means you pay a visit to the Medina as much as you can in order that you to die there and bury there. But you said that somebody had died somewhere else and he was asked to be shipped into Medina. I think you think it, you're referring to somebody who's called maybe our Sheikh Muhammad Musa Nasr. Muhammad Musa Nasr died in Saudi Arabia. He did not die outside Saudi Arabia. Okay, he died in Saudi Arabia. And he, in his wasiya, which is oral, to his uh, sons, that he wanted to, to die, to be buried in the Medina, in the graveyard of the Baqi al -Qarqa. That's what he was saying. Now, this was here was fulfilled to him because it was quick. If it is to be delayed, he should be buried where he is. But because it was fulfilled to him, so no problem if you have two cemeteries. Let's say, for example, I die here. Okay? I have a cemetery here, which has got part for the Muslims, but I'd like to be buried in, it's called a piece of garden. I, I put my was here, if I die here, piece of garden. I not here, not in Maiden or High Wickham, or to be the peace of God. So no problem to be there, to be there, because there is more of, for example, specific things for it. Because here, even though it's not a Muslim, it's proper Muslim, it's just, there's no proper irrigation. The other one is just fully Muslims. I want to be buried there. And this also, it's just like, uh, because it's a Medina. I cannot hear you at the moment, Shafi. Huh? Sorry? Can you hear me? Ahmed, can you hear me? Muhammad, Abu Muhammad, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Ahmed? Naam, alhamdulillah. We can hear you, Sheikh. Yeah, because I've been, I don't know, the, the Zoom switched off, took me outside the Zoom and then brought me back again. I don't know what happened. Allah was done. <laughs> yeah. So I say, inshallah, that it is, I would say it is not good to be transferred because it will delay. If it's delaying, if it's going to delay your, de uh, your funeral, it should not be delayed. It should be buried anywhere. But if it's not being delayed because of that person who's when he died, they had the, the head of the area, the Amir al Mantiqa. He, he had accepted straight away because of the request of all the scholars and the shiuch, and he was shipped straight away to that place. Now, he was taken in helicopter, so it's very quick, even quicker than the going to the next cemetery. 
Now, I think this is a sister. What is the reward for a wife waiting four months and ten days after her husband has died? Again, so that, Ahmed, because I'm admitting people, uh, I'm seeing people. Okay, came out. Yeah. I think I think a sister is asking in the chat. What is the reward for a yeah. wife how, who has waited four months and ten days after her husband has uh, passed away? What do you mean? What's the rule? I don't understand. What is the so, rule? The ajr, the reward. Ah, the, 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 the reward. I was trying to say reward. <laughs> the reward. What is the reward? Well, it's, a, well, it's, a, uh, it's like you're praying the prayer and it's compulsory upon you. You're going to get a reward for that. It's compulsory upon you to wait these four months and ten days, yet you're going to get a reward. Allahu A'lam, what is the reward? I mean, the person should not be, you know, like he's going to the shop. How much is this and how much is that? How much am I going to get? You're going to get this for free. Once you get something for free, you don't ask, how much was it when you gave it to you for free? You took it for free. Allah is giving to you as a reward. Okay, so it's, but I'm going to calculate how much and we start putting up. I have done four months and ten days. This is about 2,000 hasan. I have done this for both. Alhamdulillah, Allah will give you multiple. Just be patient, inshallah. Now. Go ahead, Bashir. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. <coughs> Shaykh, you know that during the uh, washing the disease, uh, people need to, uh, you know, the cut the nails or shape the pubic hairs and stuff like that. Is it allowed or not? This is one of those things that we're going to be talking about, inshallah, when it comes to the washing of the deceased and the shrine of the deceased, but you guys that's a question now. No, it's not allowed to cut the nails, not to shave the pubic hair, not to shave the uh, uh, anything except to comb the hair. That's what has been we asked, to comb the hair. So you comb the hair as for the man and you put it, uh, you comb the hair and, and as for the woman, you make it into three braids. Now, Yalla Ahmed, click one and say his name. Anwar Haider, bin Fadlik. Repeat his name. So Ali, my question is, one of the brother, his mother-in-law passed away. Uh, she had a heart attack. Okay. Uh, By the way, you took him from far, get closer to the laptop. Say it again. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, a brother, his mother-in-law, she passed away in hospital. Yep. Uh, with heart attack. And then uh, the guy is going to, you know, uh, dealing with the funeral, uh, he said he's not going to wash the body because the doctor uh, told him that she, she may go a trace of corona. What do you think about this, Sheikh? I mean, the person, uh, is he, at the moment that is being done, is he being buried, or uh, you're talking about something which is in the past? Is it now it's taking place? Now what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh, three days ago, he's been buried now, yeah, without washing, yeah. He refused Allah to Allah wash. Allah yeah. Allah yeah. Allah. He refused to wash. I, I told him, he said, you know, the doctor tell me there's a trace of corona, and he refused. Allah al-Musta'an. Allah al-Musta'an, ya khwani. Khwani, a person who dies as a Muslim, he cannot be buried except with a wash. Unless we can't use the wash, then we make tayammum. And you can't use the wash, it's for two reasons. Either there is no water, or there is water, but if I put the water, it's going to do something to the body, because he died through burning. So if I put the water, maybe his flesh will come out, his hand will come out, so I will use tayammum. But to use tayammum in the coronavirus, no, because you can't make tayammum. Because the tayammum is you have to have the body in itself to touch yes, yes. The, 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 for example, the stone or the brick or the sand. And once you uncover it, then you might as well wash it. So we know that we have doctors in the front line dealing with people who are alive, who've got COVID-19. But they've got their precautions. And those who are alive, they are more... Uh, uh, infectious than a person who is dead. I'm not saying this word myself. No, no, no. I, I've, I've been reading, and I'm, I'm, I'm also a volunteer for any person who dies through the COVID-19. Go and wash. We have a group. We wash anybody. Alhamdulillah, the ones who are in High Wickham, the ones who are in Maidenhead, and I'm saying this, and people listening, all of them had the wash. We don't bury them like this. We wash them. 
So when he's dead, his chance of transmitting the corona much, much, much less than the person who's alive. So do we say to the person who's alive, because you got corona, well, die on yourself, we're gonna touch you because you have corona. We go and treat him, we treat him again. So if he's dead, now his, his breath and all of that is finished now. There's no infectious, there's not talking that he will have spitting and sneezing on you. He's dead. Only the liquid which is on his body, that's the infectious. But it's not as infectious, as I said, uh, and dangerous when he's alive. So this person, if he did not want to wash him, he should have really phoned and rang you. Because if rang me, I would come. I would go and wash that person. If it's a lady, we've got sisters as well to wash. And if you had nobody, no men to wash the sisters, we will just put her there and we will, on her clothes, we put water on top of her. That's it. So we don't have to take the clothes off, we just put water, even on the men. You can't take the clothes off because of something, a necessity. Then we will put the water, but we don't leave him without a wash. This is, the, the, this is why we say to the person who is an imam to be equipped with the knowledge of how to lead, how to wash the deceased, how to shroud the deceased. He has to be knowledgeable. Okay? And also, uh, basically as well, the person who washes the deceased, he has to know that he's not allowed to clip the nails or to, for example, to shave the pubic hair. Somebody asked me now, he is not allowed to put cotton inside. Shafi, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? It's okay now. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. You can hear me now, yeah? Are you able no, to go no, over I'm the can now? Hear. Okay, here it I said, the last thing was that, Ahmed, I said? Yeah, you had said about the wash, but then you uh, froze. Which, you know, which, which uh, part of the wash? Yeah, sure. Huh? The knowledge that the imam should have. Yeah, the, the knowledge of the person who should have, if he's a person to wash the deceased, he should know all of these things. Can I just wash the deceased because I know how to put the water, or I know how to make him like this, and because I'm strong and have a very strong heart to wash the deceased? No, I need to know the knowledge. I need to learn, study the book. At least study that book, Hermogenes, all of it, to learn. Especially the chapter to do with the wash, and the shroud, I can't just wash like that. I, otherwise, I'm going to make, as I said, some people, they might put the cotton into the anus. Seen that? I would have been left. How can you do that? So, Allah was sad. That woman, she's been, and, and other people has been as well, they've been buried even without a prayer. And that's why some people are saying, let's make a little guy prayer of the uh, a person who's not there, has it been, been buried with that prayer? Let's make prayer of the God. And I take this opportunity and emphasize the fact yeah. that yes, yes. Ghaib, uh, yes, to be prayed on the people being buried. We, we know that they've been buried without, okay, they've been buried without a prayer. We pray on them, Salat al but not in the way which is that some people mention in a, uh, in a WhatsApp text or whatever or tweeting or all of that. That we on a certain day, let's say uh, on a name Monday, at a certain time, everybody, whether in any place, they come together and pray Salat al in each in his place. That's a bid'ah. Should not do that. But we do that, inshallah. As I said, in a, a person who had died, we know that he died. Nobody offered the prayer on him. We will offer the prayer without having him in front of us. Now, Anwar, do you have anything in question? Yes, uh, uh, yes, yes. Do you think, Sheikh, uh, in these cases, the family is wajib on the family to come forward to wash the body? It is a wajib to wash him, of course. But there is, she's been buried now already. We can't say anything. You can't dig him out or dig her out. Yeah, okay, uh, because there is hadith that uh, uh, during the Sahaba, this one of them has been buried without washing, and they have to take the body from the graveyard to wash it again. Is yeah, but, like that? Yeah, there is, but this is not here in this country, Ashik. This country can't, when somebody's buried, they will not allow you. They will take you to prison. <laughs> you can't dig somebody out and wash him. The authorities will not let you to do that. No way. And they will, you know, they will, they, you'll be putting in question. But yes, at the time of the Prophet, as I said, a number, or maybe yesterday's talk, uh, of Abdullah ibn Zayn Salul, the hypocrite man. He was buried without a wash, and his son came to the Prophet and asked him for help. So the Prophet like, 
dug him out from the grave, put him on his lap, and he blew into him, and he even gave him his cloak, okay, and he also offered the prayer on him, and then Allah Azza wa Jal, he had told the Prophet of Allah not to pray on these people because they died as kuffar. Now. Okay, a question is asking, uh, reciting Yasin for your dying ones, is it true that some of the scholars, they are making this hadith authentic? Okay, can I just ask you, Ahmed, before you ask the question, can you just lower the hand of the person who had asked the question? And Zahir, please help. Again, the question, what is that, Ya Ahmed? Uh, the question is asking to rec reciting Yasin for the dead dying ones, uh, is it true that some of the scholars make that authentic? And Sheikh Zahid got disconnected, so he's no longer been a co-host from... Uh... Okay, where is he? Put his hand, let me just make him a co-host. <laughs> okay, Zahid, yes. Well, you see, if being disconnected, I can't... I'm sorry about that. You should have rang me, Zahid. Okay, I've got you now co-host. You told me, Ahmed. I mean, I, can't, I cannot really focus on lots of things. You're focusing on these things, you just tell me. Zad has gone okay, out. Sure. And, uh, he will help you. Okay. Basically, uh, the scholars, no, there's no scholars who are from the Muhaddithi made this authentic. It is weak hadith according to all the Muhaddithi. You could say that there are some people who are not scholars of hadith. They've used it, they think it's, it's authentic. No. This is da'if jiddan. Even some of them make it fabricated. Okay. So we say that is no, there's no scholars of hadith have made it authentic. Uh, this brother's been asking this question for a couple of days now. A lot of Muslims are watching a show called Umar ibn al-Khattab series and are encouraging others to watch the show and they're depicting the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and it contains music. What's Sheikh say ask, about uh, please, Zahid, uh, can you please speak in Zahid? 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 He's not there, is he? Yeah, yeah. yeah, please, please, can you just focus on the admitting the people? Uh, uh, okay, Jazakallah Say the question again, Ahmed. Naam, Sheikh. He's asking about a series, a TV series. It's called Umar ibn al-Khattab. And, and uh, he's asking about uh, Muslims that encourage other people, let's watch, watch this show. And it, he's saying that it shows the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu It shows them actors. Uh, no, you're not allowed to look at such... Uh, a, a, a movie or a, a series of talk, uh, of episodes, uh, you're not allowed because how can you show the acting and all of that is not correct? For very I would say that, uh, let alone to say, how can you make such and such Amal Khattab? And these people, we know that they're past, they are, they are actors and actresses. No, not allowed. Okay, Sheikh, I don't understand this question. What is the ruling about the death committee? The ruling of the death committee, I don't know, understand as well. You mean like a committee who are concerned about the people who are dead in that area? The person who's asked this question, please clarify. But the people who are the death committee, they should really make sure that this person is to be taken care of in, when he's dead. That is for the washing, shrouding and burial. Now. Is it permissible to read the Witter Dua from a, a, a laptop or a phone or a piece of paper? Is it permissible to read a dua from? Yeah, the dua for witter uh, from oh, a piece of paper or a laptop. In the salah. Yeah. In the salah, Sheikh. Yeah, in the salah, Akhi, just, just do, don't, don't be holding a piece of paper. Just do dua of yours. Remember the dua of the Prophet. If you can't do, okay, then do it with the. If you can't remember the dua, then, then do, do your own dua. If you remember the dua, khalas. And you don't have to do the witter. Uh, with a dua, you just have to do the witr without a dua. So always stick to not to use something, but it is permissible. We say it's witr, it is permissible, especially for those who are non Muslims. We say it is permissible, but as I said, decrease the usage of Quran, decrease the usage of dua because you don't need it. You don't just say, Oh Lord, oh Lord, give me, oh Lord, help me, oh Lord, make me look. Look at Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib is a learned man, okay? When he was in Yemen. And he wanted to go to follow the Prophet in the only Hajj that the Prophet had made. It's called the Farewell Hajj. 
was he was about to reach the station which is called Al Miqat, and that is Yalamlam from Yemen to come in. And that is when you have to declare state of the Haram. He doesn't know. So what did he say? He didn't know. So what he said? He said, Oh Lord, I am saying what the Prophet of Allah had said. <laughs> oh Lord, I am declaring state of the Haram exactly as the Prophet of Allah. He didn't know what to say. I'm doing my talbiya according to the Prophet of Allah. And he went inside. So the, the person you know, sometimes, if he's not learned, you know, we don't we don't want you to start learning your hadith into the salah before the salah. It's a small hadith. Allahumma dini fi man hadith. If you don't know it, you don't have to say it. So don't resort to the paper. You are in the salah, the salah has to be completely focused, not to pull up something, put it back, and put something. Uh, somebody looks at you. Is he in a salah or is he playing? You're in salah. No. Asim Akhtar, please go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> My question is, um, someone who passes away during this time of coronavirus, is it correct to say that they died and they are of Shaheed status? Can you confirm I have that? done a lecture on to this year, Akh Asim, which is called coronavirus. And also I have done it at the end of class number 46 of the story of the prophets in Luton. Uh, and I addressed it as well in a, another lecture to do with the coronavirus. And I said, Ya Ikhwani, there's a difference among the scholars. How do they regard the plague, the plague, the ta'un, okay, is the one is mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet of Allah. A plague is in its wounds to the person is similar to the wounds of a shaheed. So when the Prophet ﷺ, he said, ta'un shahada, plague is martyrdom. This is the shahada given to those people who have been dead through that particular ta'un, as Imam ibn Hajar al-Qarani had said, that ta'un, which is when the dispute according to the hadith had happened between the people who are shuhada and with them, the people who died normally, regarding how, oh Lord, that these people who died through ta'un, they get the martyrdom stage. The, the, the ones who are having shahada said, how can they give, give given us the, given the, the favors of the shaheed? And the ones who died normally, uh, it might as well that you, Allah Azza wa give them this, He give it to us as well. So Allah really said to them, okay, as for the souls, look at the wounds of those who died through the power. If they look like the wounds of the shaheed, then they are like shaheed. If they are not, then they are like the ones who died normally on their day. So when they looked at the wounds, the wounds are the same. So this ta'un, let me just tell you what it comes. It comes to the thin skin on the arms, between the legs, next to the testicles. The internet says your connection is unstable. Am I okay, yeah, Ahmed? Ahmed? Zahid? Sheikh, I think you're in. Oh. Am I what? You're right. okay now, Sheikh. Okay, I'm okay. All right. Because <clears throat> it said to me a here, a sign that's unstable. So uh, th this is, it comes to the underarms, be the pubic hair between the legs, these skin which are area, that's the ta'un it comes to it, it kills the person. As for the waba, which is pandemic, that is like the virus, the corona, like all of those things which are in, it has common things between it and the ta'un, that is, it spreads quickly, infectious disease. But it's not as fatal as the ta'un, it's not the ta'un itself. So we say, every ta'un is a pandemic. But not every pandemic or epidemic is to be power. The ta'un that the Prophet Allah talked about is the one that it will never enter the Medina. As for the corona, had killed people in the Medina. It came to the Medina and killed people in the Medina. So it's not. Now, so because of that, we don't consider it as the power. But let's say that person who had corona died and he had symptoms of for example cholera or a stomach ache he died through his belly he is considered from the shaheed al maptun or he died through chest infection like the eb is from the shaheed but if he just died from the fever that's not a shaheed but as i said this is martyrdom in general in general 
But I can't say even about a person who died through this corona and he had died because of the belly is to be he himself a shaheed. Shahada as in general, but he himself as to be himself uh, Muhammad or Ahmad or whatever is a shaheed? No. So for example, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, radiallahu anhu, Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, okay, both of them died through the ta'un. The ta'un is a martyrdom. So they died through martyrdom. But we don't say as shaheed Abu Ubaidah, even though they are being given glad tidings of paradise. The shaheed was, for example, Umar al Khattab was dusted by the Kafir. A Shaheed, for example, that is Uthman al-Affan. He was killed as well because the Prophet told him not to fight. So they, or the Shaheed whom the Prophet of Allah said is a Shaheed. So he said about Umar is a Shaheed, is a Shaheed. But we can't say about anybody else a Shaheed unless the Prophet of Allah testified for him. Even the person who dies in the battlefield, we say, we hope for him Shahada. But to be Shaheed? No, we can't say that for him. And that is what we find in Sahih al-Bukhari, chapter title, La yuqalu an fulan shaheed. We don't say about somebody who died, even through the battlefield, to be shaheed himself. We say we hope for him, at least to be shaheed. I hope that this question had been answered. Did it, was it answered, Ya Akhi Asr? Akhi Asr, are you there? Can you okay. hear me? Yes, I could hear you now. Yeah. I could. Just unmuted you, sorry. Yeah. No, no, because just, Ahmad, 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 please focus, focus, please. Unmute them. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just a little bit confused because um, I've had some shakes say that just, if, if you die of coronavirus, then it, then you are shaheed, and and they've been saying this because um. I've answered the question. I'm, 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 don't tell me about your confusion. Have you, have you answered? Have I answered the question for you? Yeah. No, you've answered them, and. And I hear what you're saying. All I'm saying is that I've also heard that it, you are shaheed if you die of coronavirus. So I'm, I'm, I'm hearing two opposing views. That's what I'm saying. Two opposing views. That's not, that's not my question. You had an opposing view. You, you just told me before that when you came in, you said to me that whether is he shaheed or not. It doesn't matter what the... Have I answered you whether you're convinced or not? I said to you, Ta'oon does okay, not... Okay, yes, yes, you have Asim. 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 Yes, wait. Ta'oon does not enter the Medina. Corona, I'm asking you, did it enter the Medina or not? I don't know, brother, but you yes, told me. Yes, I know. I know. Ahmad, you are in Medina. Was there coronavirus there or not, Ahmad? Yes. Okay. He's okay, a student no. in Medina. Okay? So, Ahmad, he's a student in Medina. All right? In the University of Medina. There is Corona there. Okay? But it's not the Ta'un. Jazakallah khayra. Okay. Jazakallah. Jazakallah, Habibi. Barakallah fiqh. Okay, Ahmed Muhammad Hussein, go ahead, please. No. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Sheikh, regarding and basically Ramadan and the nautical time, twilight. I'm going to just ask while he's asking the question, lower his hand, Ya Ahmed, or Zahid, lower his hand. So we know that he's about it. Ma'am, Jazakallah khair. Keep, keep. Fantastic. Keep, keep. Yeah, go on. Sheikh, my local timetable is about 10 to 15 minutes behind the nautical time, twilight. So what, my question was, is it better to stop eating the time of my local masjid, even though there's 15 minute gap. And does it mean if I decided to stop 15 minutes before eating, I cannot pray Fajr before the nautical twilight? Okay, the person all the time has to have, uh, if he doesn't know, safety regarding his prayer and safety regarding his Fajr. If you want to know whether the nautical is correct or whether your message is correct, you need yourself to come out now and start calculating. If you calculated what time is the Fajr, then you will add, for example, uh, you will subtract, so you two minutes, three minutes, three minutes, one minute, one minute, you will know the subtraction. But you have to calculate it yourself. If you didn't do that, and I presume you didn't do that, or you were not going to do this, then you take precaution regarding your fast, so you stop to your masjid. And you take precaution regarding your prayer, and you pray after the nautical. After that, you don't play when you're, when the, because you're, you said to me the multiple in Google, let's say, say, for example, let's say it is five o'clock, whereas your masjid says 4.45. You stop eating 4.45 and you don't play until it is five o'clock. Is that understood? Jazakallah, Sheikh.
Majid or Majid, go ahead. Yalla Majid. Tafadhal ya Majid, unmute him, just unmute. Unmute Majid, he's unmuted. Ji, uh, Asalaamu As Alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, just a quick question regarding the morning and evening du'as. So just wanted to know the evening time, is it before or after, after sunset? There are okay. Muslimas cars. Yeah. Okay, let me just tell you. Definitely, definitely, it is after Maghrib. But you ask, so 100% is after Maghrib. So if you did after Maghrib, you're 100%. But is the start Asr or is Maghrib? That's the question. A difference among the scholars. Our Sheikh Al Albani says after Asr, Rahimahullah. One of his students, he dares to say the other way, unless the Sheikh had died, and then he made his own comment, and he says after Maghrib. Now, I am with the ones who says after Asr, because when you say after Asr, you include the Maghrib. If you said after Maghrib, you don't include the Asr. So be on the cautious side, you believe it do after Asr. Because if you did it after Maghrib and it was after the Asr, then you're going to have that gap of time and you might struck with illness. So do your adhkar to protect yourself from the Asr prayer. Okay? What is the minimum number for a janaza? The question asks. Uh, okay, okay. I'm, I'm just asking the person. Is that okay with the one who's asked the question? Maybe you muted him again. Imagine. Are you okay, inshallah? Because I want to follow up. Let him... Don't mute him, Yaqwani, until he finishes. And the brother will ask the question. When you are muted, ask to be unmuted. Because the brothers who are co hosts are still, you know. Are you okay? Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah, Shaykh. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah khair. The question is asking what is the minimum number for the Janazah prayer, Shaykh? The minimum Janazah prayer is three. And we're going to talk about that, inshallah, when it comes to the prayer. Now. Okay, Abu Ibrahim, please go ahead. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Jazakallah khair. I've got a quick question in regards to uh, um, when the fast in, in terms of drinking and uh, for the time. So I read a hadith a while ago that uh, um, I can't remember the hadith, so do forgive me. Um, when fudge, when fudge kicks in, you can still continue drinking if you've got like a half a glass or a glass left when when fudge kicks in when during uh, Ramadan. Um, is that um, permissible. Okay, lower his hand and keep his microphone on. Keep your microphone on, Akhi. If you clicked it off, you can't, you have to, brother has to put it on. Put it on for him, please. Unmute him, please. Akhuna Awal Rahim Abu Ibrahim. Let me do it myself. Okay, just keep, keep on listening to me here because I want, want to talk. So basically, what you're saying here, oh, now mute him because you got noise. You got noise, Akhi, brother. <laughs> You got noise, yeah. So basically, um, this hadith I have addressed it a number of times and address it again. I said, This person, when he mixes sahur, please don't mix sahur just about one minute before the uh, uh, the time, which is the fajr. You try to make up before. But if it happened that you woke up before or you woke up just, just before, okay, and you started eating, it means don't stop your eating until you finished. Even the adhan or the time had came in. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Man sami anida, sami nida, wa fi yadi ahadikum al ina, fala yabahu hatta yukmila hajata. If one of you to hear the adhan while the cup or the bowl or the, or, the, or the pot is in his hand, that means he's eating, then let him, don't let him go of it until he is finished. It doesn't mean I have to carry it. I don't put it on the floor. No, it means that your food is there. So finish. Finishing here takes you about four, five minutes, three minutes. It doesn't matter, even after Fajr. Because Prophet Muhammad said, la, la yadah, do not leave it. As long as you have started before. Now. And let's just have a last question, Ya Akhi. It's finished, inshallah. Last okay. question. Okay. Abdul Hafid. Adil Hafiz. Assalamu alaikum, Ustad. My mistake. Yeah. Taraka. It doesn't matter. Sad, do you have to uh, pray the janaza quietly or can you pray it loud, out loud? Well done question. The janaza to be prayed when we talk about the prayer is to be uh, prayed with low, which is silent, not with loud. 
as we find some of the people they do it loud that's incorrect or hadith abdullah ibn abbas which he done it he done it because of he wanted to teach the people the bedouins who came from areas which they don't know about the, the, the deen that that fatiha is part of the prayer for some of them they think that they don't there's no fatiha in salat al janazah he wanted to teach them he read loudly but the sunnah is to read it like in the haram I'm not saying the haram, everything's correct, but in the haram, they recited what? Silently. Whether you are in Fajr prayer, Dhuhr prayer, Asr prayer, at any time, you pray Salat al-Janazah silently, not loudly. Does that answer your question, Ya Adil? Yes, it does. Jazakallah. Allah Subhanakallah, bihamdik. Ashhadu Allah, ilaha, astaghfiruka, tindakullah, khaira, barakallah, fikum. See you at 8.45, inshallah.